So uh, thank you for inviting me. Right, I'm going to be talking about uh, type 1 x-ray bursts. Uh, a type 1 x-ray burst is a, a thermonuclear explosion that occurs on the surface of an accreting neutron star. So let me just give you a little uh, uh, overview before I, I start my talk. So this is a, a light curve of what a typical type 1 x-ray burst looks like. Okay. So this is the, uh, the x-ray counts as a function of time. And a type 1 x-ray burst is characterized by a very fast rise, like a second or so, with this exponential-like tail. Okay. And this insert in this image is supposed to be the uh, Fourier transform of the light curve in the burst tail. And you see that there's a lot of power at about 363 hertz. Okay. And this is to, to illustrate that, that there are oscillations that occur in, in the light curve at about 363 hertz. So this was actually the, the first discovery of, of burst oscillations um, in, back in 1996. And since then, we've seen oscillations in, about, in the light curves of bursts from about 20 different systems. Okay. Um, so one of the most uh, exciting things uh, and the easiest thing that you can um, derive from the oscillations is that, and as I'll explain later, we think that the oscillations correspond to pretty much the uh, spin frequency of the neutron star. Okay, so this would imply that this neutron star uh, is spinning about 363 hertz. Okay, so and that's uh, exciting in a few ways. So first of all, it's it's sort of a, a link uh, in um, in evolution, right? So we think uh, that neutron stars are spun up by accretion, and the neutron stars in these systems are very old and have uh, accreted a lot of of mass, and this kind of illustrates that it's probably, in fact, true, okay? So what, but what I'll be talking about um, today, what I want to uh, emphasize in this talk, is why we see these oscillations in the, the, the type 1 x-ray burst light curves, okay? So there has to be some asymmetry, or, or in particular, a non-axisymmetry on the surface of the, the neutron star to cause these oscillations, right? So if you picture something simple like a hot spot. So if here's a, a hot spot on the surface of a, of a rapidly rotating neutron star, okay, and each time it rotates and it passes through your, your line of sight, you're going to see a, an increase in the, in the light curve, and that would produce the, the oscillations. Okay? And so um, one of the things I want to answer is, what is the non-axisymmetry on the neutron star? Is it something like a hot spot, or is it something else? Um, and it'll turn out that there will be actually two answers to this, depending on the, the type of oscillations. Um, there will be oscillations that occur during this phase, uh, called burst rise oscillations, and there'll be a different kind of oscillation in the decay. And it'll turn out that these will be two different animals. All right. So that, but that's one of the questions I, I want to ask. What is it that is uh, generating the, these oscillations? And then uh, another related question is, okay, so we know maybe it's a hot spot or a mode or something else. What is it that drives that asymmetry or the mode or whatever, okay? So it's, you know, what causes the oscillations and what, and what drives these oscillations? And those are the, the, the two things uh, I'm going to be addressing. So we'll see that they, these oscillations occur in only a, a subset of type 1 x-ray bursts. Not all, if you look at one system, sometimes uh, the bursts will show oscillations, sometimes they don't. Sometimes uh, in some systems they never show oscillations, sometimes they almost always, okay? And so um, by addressing the, these questions, I want to uh, explain to you, you know, why we see the oscillations in so sometimes, and then, of course, why we don't, why they're, they're suppressed, okay? All right, and so that, um, these questions motivate my, the outline of this talk. So I'll, I'll start with a, a quick review of uh, just neutron stars in general, and in particular, neutron stars that are accreting in a low-mass X-ray binary. Okay. And then I'll uh, go into just a, an introduction of type 1 X-ray burst. What is an X-ray burst? You know, what's the basic physics going on? It'll turn out that some of the, the physics, um, and in particular the, the nuclear physics of the type 1 X-ray burst is actually crucial to understanding the the oscillations themselves, which are going to be the, the focus of the talk. Okay, so this will be not only an introduction, but we'll give you some of the background that we need to answer these questions. What generates the oscillations and, and so on. All right. 
And so as I alluded to before, there's really two types of, of oscillations, some that occur during the rise and some that occurred during the decay. They turn out to be you know, separate things, and I'll talk about each of them in turn. And then um, I'll end with a brief summary and then um, a list of questions that is probably longer than the uh, questions that I've answered. But all right, so let's um, begin. So uh, um, type 1 x-ray bursts occur in what are known as low mass x-ray binaries. So a low mass x-ray binary consists of uh, just a regular mass donor star less massive than, than the neutron star, say maybe a solar mass, something like that. Um, gravity from the neutron star strips matter from the, from the donor star. And this uh, strip matter has angular momentum, so it doesn't fall directly on the neutron star, but in fact uh, uh, revolves around the, the neutron star and accretion disk. Somehow this par uh, parcel of matter in the accretion disk will lose angular momentum and kind of spiral inwards towards the, the neutron star and eventually will land on the, the neutron star surface. Okay? And from now on, we're going to be concerned entirely with the fate of the matter that lands on the surface of the neutron star. Anyway, I just want to add, if you guys have any questions during the talk, please uh, interrupt me during the talk. Okay. So this is just a, a basic uh, review of what a neutron star is and, and what's going on in the, in the interior. Okay. So typical neutron star uh, parameters, masses of roughly like 1.4 solar masses, uh, radii maybe 12 kilometers or so. And so something that can compact is an extremely large um, gravitational force at its surface. So the gravitational acceleration is about 10 to the 11 times greater than that on Earth. Okay. So I've, there's several ways you can divide up a, a, a neutron star interior. Um, and I've chosen a somewhat basic way, but just to give you a flavor of what's inside the neutron star. So I'm going to call the outermost layer the surface, which constitutes only about a meter or so uh, of the neutron star. And that'll consist of basically the, the accreted matter from the donor star. And there's nothing so special um, about it. It's just basic uh, um, ionized matter. Okay? Um, below that, the, the matter gets more and more um, dense. So when we get to densities, say, between, uh, above, say, 10 to the 6 solar masses, the, uh, the ions are so uh, densely packed that they act as actually a Coulomb liquid. Okay? And this Coulomb liquid is what we call the, the ocean of the neutron star. Okay? So that consists of very degenerate electrons and just uh, um, ions in a, in a liquid phase. As we get even deeper and denser to um, density of, say, 10 to the 9 grams per cubic centimeter, the, the, the ions are so dense that they actually solidify and form some sort of uh, a Coulomb lattice. So, and this was what um, delineates the, the ocean from the crust. Okay? So in the crust, we have very degenerate, very relativistic electrons. Um, we have solid, very neutron-rich nuclei. Some of the electrons will combine with uh, the protons of the, the nuclei when we get to these high densities and make nuclei that are very neutron-rich, more neutron-rich than you'd have, say, in a terrestrial laboratory. And then even deeper, we'll get some free neutrons. Uh, once we get to about 2 times 10 to the 14 grams per cubic centimeter, that's roughly the, the density of an actual nucleus in, a, in an atom. Once we get to a, a density um, that high, we've reached the core. So the nuclei have completely dissolved. And basically, we don't know what's going on in the core. It may just be protons and neutrons and electrons and muons or something like that. There may be some more exotic um, uh, state of matter, like quark matter, there may be uh, kaon condensate. Um, it's really not known, but it's one of almost like the holy grails of, of nuclear physics and, uh, and uh, neutron star astronomy and astrophysics. What is the, the state of matter in the core? And the core actually takes up a lot of the, the neutron star. So it consists of about 99% of the mass of the neutron star. So everything else is just you know, a very small fraction of the neutron star and about 90% of the radius. And um, it's interesting that we know so little about so much of the, of the neutron star. Okay. But for, um, for us, we're just going to consider the, the outer meter or so of the neutron star. That's where all the action is going to happen today. 
But I'll just note in passing, it's, it's interesting that um, these type 1 x-ray bursts, which occur in the surface, um, we can use some of them, uh, some of their properties to actually study what's going on in the core of a, of a neutron star, in particular to study the, the equation of state of a neutron star. So that's one of the, the many motivations of, of studying type 1 x-ray bursts. Um, so I won't go into that in detail, but uh, I'll mention it a little later in the, in the talk. Is the remaining 1% of mass subject to bias between emission and growth? Well, let's see. Um, I would say, you know, this is basically epsilon. This is a little more than epsilon. And then most of the matter is actually in the, in the crust. So that would consist of at least, you know, um, 0.9 or 0.99% or something. So, yeah, this is definitely by far the most massive, and then the second would be by far the second most massive is the crust, and so on. Okay. So it's a little surprising that I'm actually talking about nuclear burning on, on a neutron star. If we just look at the, the energetics, okay? So nuclear burning for uh, a composition of you know, solar material, mostly hydrogen and helium. Um, if you burn it to iron or something, you get about 5 MeV per nucleon. But the gravitational energy, the energy of just, of just dropping a, a, neut a neutron or a baryon onto the surface of the, the neutron star, that releases about 200 MeV per baryon. Okay? So if you think of the steady state case, what if we just had steady state nuclear burning? Matter falls on the neutron star, sits there for a little bit, and then it burns in steady state at the same rate that it's accreting. You know, you'd really never know that nuclear burning uh, were happening on, on, the, on the neutron star because the vast majority of the, the energy that you'd see is actually the energy released when the, the neutron star decelerates when it hits the, the surface, okay? So, well, you know, I'm talking about nuclear burning on neutron stars. So how do we actually see this nuclear burning that occurs on the surface of a neutron star? And by the way, this... Um, ratio is the other way around for basically any other astrophysical object. Even in a white dwarf, nuclear burning, if it occurs on the surface, will greatly swamp out the, the uh, uh, energy released in, uh, due to gravity. Okay. Well, the answer is when the nuclear burning happens not in steady state, but it burns basically all at once. And this <coughs> burning that occurs almost all at once is what we call a type 1 x-ray burst. Okay, so specifically a type 1 x-ray burst is a thermonuclear explosion that occurs on uh, the surface of a, an accreting neutron star triggered by un thermally unstable nuclear burning. Okay. So here I have just a, a basic light curve of a, of a type 1 x-ray burst. We saw this before on the, on the first slide. So here we have some intensity. X-ray intensity is a function of time. All right. And again, they're, they're character so here we have just the uh, energy released by accretion, right? Just the, you drop matter on the, on the surface and it releases energy as it hits the neutron star surface. Okay, here's the, the start of the burst. It's characterized by a very fast rise, maybe lasting a second or so, uh, where a lot of the nuclear burning occurs, and then followed by a decay, which may last a few seconds or a minute or something like that. So this looks very typical of a, of a the type 1 x-ray burst. And here are just some, some energetics. Uh, in total, the energy release is like 10 to the 39 to 10 to the 40 ergs. Just to put that in perspective, it's much less than, say, uh, a supernova or something, which released 10 to the 51 in photons. Ergs. But um, it's much more than, say, the, the, the sun releases in, in a second. So it, it's about the much energy that the sun releases in about like a week or a month, just in a few seconds. Okay? So they, they last um, very quickly. It's only 10 to 100 seconds. And that time scale we'll see later actually depends on the, the type of matter that's burned. And they recur every few hours to days, depending on some parameters. You notice that the duty cycle is very small, right? The duration is only a minute compared to the few hours or days that you have to wait for the matter to, to accumulate. Okay, and so in the, in the simplest picture, type 1 x-ray bursts um, under, exhibit a, a limit cycle behavior. So if you picture just a bare neutron star, and it's turned on the accreting, um, the accretion, this uh, layer of matter just builds up and builds up. And at the base of the layer, it gets, it's getting hotter and denser. And inevitably, nuclear burning is going to occur, right, if, if the matter keeps uh, accreting. Um, 
And when that happens, the entire layer burns up and creates heavy ashes, and then you start again. So I've made a little cartoon um, of this behavior. So we'll just start here. Right, so we're just, uh, we have some bare neutron star, whatever that means. We creep matter. This pile, this uh, layer of accreted matter um, starts to build up. And eventually at the bottom, it's you know, hot and dense enough where you're going to have nuclear reactions. And if they're thermally unstable, then this whole layer of accreted fuel is going to burn in a very short time scale and give you a type 1 x-ray burst and produce heavy ashes on which uh, the accreted matter will subsequently uh, land, okay? So why does it burst, okay? So I said that we have this unstable nuclear burning. Um, and so I want to uh, paint just a basic picture to, to, to get, develop a basic understanding of, of why we had this uh, thermal instability. Okay, so let's, for simplicity, let's just consider quiescent nuclear burning on the surface of a neutron star, okay? So this uh, freshly created fuel, it's burning at the same rate at which it's accreting, okay? So this is some steady state uh, profile, all right? So I'm gonna define two terms, right? The nuclear burning, or the, the heating rate due to nuclear reactions, and then the cooling rate, so wherever the, the um, Burning happens, right? Photons have to diffuse through the uh, accreted layer and then off the surface, okay? And let's just picture a steady state um, scenario and then we'll construct a thermal, conduct a thermal stability analysis, okay? So in steady state, we have, of course, by definition, the, the heating rate equals the cooling rate. And now let's just consider a positive temperature perturbation in the ignition region. Let's just say we up the, the temperature a little bit. So normally, uh, if you up the temperature, the, the um, nuclear reactions will happen faster, right? The ions are going to be moving a little faster. They can penetrate the, the coolant barriers. So the uh, energy generation rate will increase. And in turn, the, the cooling rate will increase. You increase the, the thermal gradient, and you'll have more cooling via radiative diffusion and emission. But if the marginal increase in the nuclear reaction rate exceeds the marginal increase in the cooling rate, um, this will heat up the, the layer further, and thus you have a thermal instability, right? Positive temperature perturbation will cause the temperature to increase it even more. Uh, so you have a thermal instability and hence a type 1 x-ray burst. Okay. So I just had this uh, nuclear reaction rate here, and I wasn't specific as to which uh, reactions actually triggered the burst, and that's what I'll get into now. All right. So um, this is a basic picture, but this physics is, is, will turn out to be vitally important to understanding what is generating the, the oscillations, which is the, the goal of this talk. Okay. How thick is that pentagram? It's about this high. It's about a meter or so. This, uh, yeah, this, this, yeah, it's about a meter or so. Right. Right. Yeah, the optical depth is like 10 to the 7, a few times 10 to the 7. But it diffuses out, right. I mean, the optical depth below is just is even much longer than that. So if there's any, right, so I have all the arrows pointed up, but if there's any, yeah, of course there'll be some diffusion downward, but it will um, inevitably, um, all the energy will inevitably be released through the surface, actually in a very short time scale. There's not much delay occurred from any of the thermal diffusion downward. Um, okay, so for conduction, for most X-ray bursts, and in particular the X-ray bursts that I'm going to talk about, um, conduction is negligible compared to uh, radiation. There are some bursts that that are ignited in an even deeper layer. And in th those cases, the density is high enough where electron conduction is important. Um, and you asked about convection. In the initial stages of some bursts, and in particular very powerful bursts, you do get uh, a very efficient convection zone. And I I'll actually talk about that a little later. Um, but yeah, you can have an, a, 
burning can be rapid enough such that you do generate a convection zone um, in the initial stages uh, of the burst, like soon after the, uh, the thermal instability. Okay. All right, so we have this uh, generalized nuclear uh, burning rate, and now I want to talk about the, the actual nuclear reactions that are occurring. Okay, so we're, we're thinking of uh, accreted material from a star like the, the sun or something. So the sun contains um, mostly hydrogen, 70% or so by mass. Um, so the hydrogen is by far the most abundant. And also hydrogen burning to, to iron peak elements releases the most energy per baryon. Okay. So whatever we do, we have to think about what's happening to the accreted hydrogen. Okay. But for the uh, temperatures uh, of interest to us, which are above, you know, say, 10 to the 8 Kelvin, that's the typical temperature in this uh, accreted layer, uh, hydrogen burns what is known as the hot CNO cycle. This is a little different than the, the CNO cycle that occurs in the centers of massive stars. That's called the CNO cycle or the, the cold CNO cycle. So unlike the CNO cycle that happens in many uh, massive stars, uh, the hot CNO cycle um, involves two beta decays of, uh, of oxygen. The cold CNO cycle has a beta decay in nitrogen, if that's familiar to you. Okay. Um, so just to explain this, this notation, which is common in, uh, in nuclear physics and nuclear astrophysics, this means so carbon-12 uh, fuses with a proton, releases a, a gamma a photon, gives you nitrogen-13, fuses with a proton, releases a gamma, gives you oxygen-14. Oxygen-14 beta decays, releases a positron and a neutrino, gives you nitrogen-14, et cetera. Okay. So um, what do I want you to, to get out of this? The, the details aren't important. But there are two things that, that are. Um, number one, so carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are just simply catalysts. Okay? What we want to do is convert four protons to a helium-4 and two positrons. Right? So we're just converting hydrogen to helium like any normal star will do. Right? And it always occurs you know, through this way. It's just the mechanism by which this uh, process occurs. Okay? And second, and very importantly, um, for the conditions of most type 1 x-ray bursts, um, these uh, slow beta decays totally uh, dominate the, the rate of, the, of this cycle. Okay? So these, in particular, these beta decays are very slow relative to the thermonuclear reaction. So this happens, these guys all happen on a time scale, say, much less than a second, where it takes maybe like a minute or two minutes for these beta decays to occur. Okay? So anytime you have hydrogen burning, you have to have these beta decays. You have to convert some protons to neutrons. Okay? If you're going to burn anything that's 100% protons to, say, 50% protons and neutrons, you've got to convert some of those protons to neutrons. Okay? So this is a very generic um, uh, quality of, of, of hydrogen burning. You have these weak decays. Okay? And here, they're by far the slowest. And therefore, they set the rates of this hot CNO cycle. Okay? So in particular, uh, beta decays are temperature independent. They don't care what the temperature is. They'll, they'll, they'll do their own thing. And so um, hydrogen burning by uh, the hot CNO cycle is temperature independent. And, if you, and therefore, it will not give you a, uh, a thermal instability. Right? The, the rate is independent of the, the temperature. So our second guess should be helium burning. Helium is the next most abundant ion, right, gives us the, the next greatest uh, uh, energy release when you burn it up to, to iron. And uh, helium will, and it's also created by this hot CNO cycle, okay. Uh, unlike the hot CNO cycle, helium burning goes to the, the triple alpha reaction, which is very temperature sensitive. There's no beta decays or anything in here, okay, so it just has to be, you know, cool and repulsion, right. So this is the same a uh, reaction that, again, will occur in very massive stars. And it's basically essentially all elements uh, greater than hydrogen and helium that we have in the universe have gone through this, this reaction in, in some way. Okay. So it looks like helium is a good choice. And in fact, you know, for uh, the simplest explanation, that, that really is the, the case. The triple alpha reaction, helium burning, is very temperature sensitive. 
and therefore it triggers type 1 x-ray bursts. Okay. Uh, and this is just a, a picture of what I said in, in words before. Okay. So we have uh, the energy generation rate, or the log thereof, as a function of temperature. Okay. The range of inches to us is like here, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, something like that. The hydrogen burning reaction rate is temperature sensitive. Okay. So these lines correspond to different densities. Um, but you see, they don't care about the hydrogen uh, burning rate, doesn't care about temperature or density or anything. It's just set totally by the, the beta decays. Okay. Whereas the helium burning is extremely temperature sensitive. Okay. And therefore, it's the helium burning which is the most important in, in setting the, um, the, uh, the thermal instability. Although things get, a, in reality, of course, is a, is a little more complicated, right? We still have all this hydrogen around. It's got to burn quickly somehow if we're going to have this, this very energetic burst, right? Okay, so things get a little more complicated when hydrogen is present, all right? So um, if you look before, we had, uh, right, the CNO cycle would start and end with carbon, or you can start anywhere you want, but um, it involves carbon-12. Uh, which itself is produced in the, in the uh, triple alpha reaction. So you have this kind of interplay between the two. Hydrogen burning creates uh, helium-4, or alphas, for your uh, triple alpha reaction. The triple alpha reaction, in turn, creates carbon-12 that will accelerate the, the uh, hot CNO cycle. Okay? So there's this interplay between the two reactions. And this interplay actually is um, vitally important in the, the triggering of X-ray bursts, and it will also be very important for or the focus of this talk, the uh, generation of the oscillations. Because it will turn out this um, interplay will set the, um, the composition of the matter um, at ignition, if ignition occurs, which we'll see in a few minutes is, is vitally important to whether or not we're going to actually see oscillations. Okay. So uh, it turns out the hot CNO cycle will stabilize nuclear burning because it's temperature insensitive. But if you want to have a, a thermal instability, you somehow have to break out of this hot CNO cycle. All right? You have to be able to burn hydrogen at a much faster rate. Um, and this is called, which I won't go into detail, what's called the uh, rapid proton or RP process. Okay. So no matter how you burn hydrogen, you're always going to have these slow beta decays. Okay? Um, since these beta decays are so slow, they're going to extend the, the lifetime of the burst if you actually have a thermal instability. Okay? And so you can tell the composition, in a sense, you can tell the composition, what the composition was at the time of ignition by the duration of the burst. Okay? So I have two examples, right? So, um, uh, so the burst rise um, is determined by the, the flame spreading, the, the burning. We have uh, flame spreading across the neutron star. That'll be very quick. Um, and so if the burning is slow uh, during the rise, it'll extend the, the, light, the light curve. So you notice that this uh, rise takes about five seconds, where this guy takes maybe a second or less than that. Um, and even more telling is, is the, the burst decay. Um, this guy is very short, maybe it lasts a few seconds, where this guy lasts over a minute. Okay? So from looking at the light curves, we can say that this is a very hydrogen poor burst. Okay? It's hydrogen poor because it's very quick and there are, um, there are not a lot of these hyd uh, beta decays on hydrogen rich nuclei that will extend the light curve. Whereas conversely, these guys are presumably hydrogen rich because there's going to be a lot of these beta decays. Right, they're going to happen, you know, seconds or tens of seconds out in the, in the, the light curve of the burst, and that will extend the, bur the burst light curve. So we can tell the composition um, of the material before the ignition occurred by what the, the subsequent light curve looks like. Okay. Those are re really hard. They look basically like uh, black bodies. There's um, there have been some stories of like seeing uh, iron lines in a burst, but those are pretty weak and hard to, to reproduce. But it would be really interesting if you could, and you know it's still in the realm of possibility, you probably wouldn't see the hydrogen lines, but 
if you could see the products of the nuclear burning in the burst, like a line from one of the products, you know, one of the weird uh, uh, proton-rich uh, uh, isotopes, that w that in itself would be a, an indication of, of the, the burning. But see hydrogen aligns. That, that's as far as I know. Yeah. Say that again. The rise. Okay. Well, the rise. Well, here the rise I think is slower. This is like five or ten seconds. Where this is. Okay. So, um, well, again, I mean, you you still have beta decays even the, in the rise. So the rise, the rise gets a little complicated because you have these two competing things. You have the the flame propagation, which I'll actually talk about very shortly. There's a time scale over which the, the it takes for the flame to propagate from an ignition point over the entire neutron star surface. Okay, so if that's fast relative to say your nuclear burning time scale, then it will be set by your nuclear burning time scale, which in here is slow because again there's hydrogen um, burning and therefore a lot of beta decays. But here um, it could be that the flame speed itself is your limiting factor. Right? If you have a lot of say pure helium or something, which you know, we'll just go as fast as a. Uh, uh, the hydrogen is so independently that if your helium ignites, it's pure helium or thermal runaway, it's much faster because it's just less thermal contact. There's no dead matter in there. There's dead weight that you have to heat up. Well, I think it's a little too simple. All the hydrogen is, is still going to burn. It's not. I know, I know. Yeah. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's, you know, if you have pure helium, you're releasing less energy. Right, so you kind of have that competition. But it, if you have hydrogen, the slow decays will kind of win out. Um, the thermal time is um, well, it's a fun it's going to be a function of temperature, but it's on the order of a few seconds. But it's less than the decay time scale. Okay, so in particular, you know that this can't be just cooling. Right, because if it were just cooling, it would fall off like that. It could affect the the rise. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, again, going into the details, there is a delay between the actual nuclear burning and what you see. You know, the nuclear burning may peak here, whereas the light curve peaks here, because you have this time delay of the thermal time uh, through the layer. And then, if there's a convection zone, then that will complicate things further. But yeah, there is, you know. The thermal time is not zero, um, and it's a function of a few things. But um, uh, you can't explain this long tail by the thermal time. Maybe you can explain some of the long, t the short tail by the, the thermal time. Okay. Any more questions? These are good. Okay. Um, so the composition determines the uh, uh, what the light curve looks like. Okay. Now, in some of these light curves, and this kind of gets to the meat of my uh, talk, we see oscillations. We see oscillations in the light curves of some bursts. Okay? And there, there's two different uh, categories. There are some that will occur in the rise. Okay? So this is the uh, light curve, right? the rise of some burst. And if you zoom in, you know, this is it's sort of just for show, but it, um, it illustrates that there's oscillations in, the, in that portion of the light curve. And then this image is a little more complicated, so let me slow down a little bit. This shows, this line is the actual light curve. The, the intensity is a function of time. And then uh, overlaid on that is the frequency of the oscillation, okay? And you'll see it rises a little bit. Okay, so what is this telling you? This is the, uh, the light curve, and once you get past the peak, we detect an oscillation at you know, 330 hertz, roughly, that increases by a few hertz and lasts for the majority of the, the burst decay. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, each of these in, in, in turn in a second. But let me uh, just sum. Yeah. No, these are kind of the, um, 
the error bars of, of yeah, 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 exactly, right. The highest amplitude usually, yeah, is in the in the beginning, right? Yeah, near to the, I guess around here, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so let me just tell you uh, a little bit about oscillations in general. Um, there's very large flux amplitudes. These are not, you know, puny little oscillations that are, you know, these are, are you know, really happening. They're, they can be really strong, especially in the rise. And uh, so, what, 75% amplitudes in the rise? And, and they'll kind of make sense once we get into the, the actual physics of what's going on. And then, like, 10% in the decay, but it's still significant. Uh, they're very sinusoidal. Uh, as we saw before, there's this frequency drift of about a few hertz in the tail, um, which is characteristic of many of the, the oscillations in the tail. Um, although there's this drift, the asymptotic frequency is always very stable to like one part in a thousand. All right? And this is indicative of, of um, what the asymptotic frequency is. So we think largely by the stability and a few other reasons that um, this asymptotic frequency is exactly or very close to the rotation frequency of the neutron star because only something like the rotation of the fr frequency of the neutron star could be that stable over, you know, years and many bursts, okay? So it's cool because it can tell us the, the frequency of the, the neutron star rotation, right? Um, they occur primarily in short duration bursts, right? So we remember before we saw that the duration of a burst is a function of the composition at ignition. In short duration bursts, they have very little hydrogen, and that'll become very important once we understand you know, why would they occur only in short duration bursts. And furthermore, they occur only at high accretion rates. Um, so this is my little uh, cartoon again, just uh, illustrating this point. We see uh, type 1 X-ray bursts at pretty much all accretion rates up to about 30% Eddington. Above that, in general, we see no bursts. But the oscillations occur only at a, the highest end of this uh, range, between roughly you know, 10 or 15 and 30 percent Eddington. Okay? So these are some of the things that I want to explain, and they'll kind of fall out naturally once we know the, the physics that generates these oscillations. Um, so again, this gets uh, a little on the technical. There are no, if you exclude the uh, accretion-powered millisecond pulsars, like Sachs J1808 uh, and stuff, uh, all the bursts that show oscillations are from very short bursts. Um, zero of them uh, have very long durations. Um, those from pure helium accretion, um, it's hard to tell. There's there are some systems which we think may be pure helium or nearly pure helium. Uh, one definitely doesn't show oscillations as far as I know, and the other may. Uh, the other candidate does show oscillations. Um, we're not really sure what the, the composition is. So it gets a little, that gets a little fuzzy. Um, but the, uh, the generalization, generalizations are definitely, um, are definitely true. Um, it's hard to, to judge what the composition of the accreted matter really is. And also, you know, although you may be accreting hydrogen-rich matter, you can still get a short duration burst from that if you burn a lot of the hydrogen prior to ignition. So it's not necessarily the composition of the accreted matter that matters. It's the composition of the matter right before ignition. Okay, so you can have some stable burning. Again, these are uh, technical details uh, that are important, but um, I don't want them to um, complicate the, the picture too much. Um, okay, so uh, some reasons to study burst oscillations, right? They can tell us a lot of things about, uh, about neutron stars. So as I mentioned before, they can tell us the neutron star spin frequency which is interesting in several uh, respects, which I won't go into. Um, but they can uh, maybe tell us something about the, the equation of state, how fast 
the, you know, the fastest rate it can spin. Um, uh, looking at the amplitudes of the oscillations can tell us something about the compactness and thereby the equation of state of neutron stars. Uh, and they can also tell us about flame propagation over the stellar surface. So in all these cases, you know, os we can learn about uh, extreme physics, ext uh, physics in um, very high temperature environments and very dense environments by studying oscillations. So, you know, we can learn a lot about neutron stars aside from just what's causing the, the oscillations themselves, which is part of the motiv motivation why the burst oscillations are such a hot topic, been such a hot topic in the last few years. All right. Okay, so let me start um, talking about the oscillations that occur in the burst rise. All right. So I'll just give the cause um, outright. We think that what causes the oscillations in the rise is just the rotational modulation of a hot spot. Okay, it's kind of the simplest picture you can think of. There's some hot spot on the neutron star. As it rotates, it goes in and out of your field of view and, and generates the oscillations, right? So just picture this uh, neutron star with this hot spot spinning on its rotation axis, okay? Um, and we think this hot spot comes from uh, just the ignition and subsequent uh, flame propagation of the, of the actual thermal instability, okay? So the rise time of a burst is like a second or so, the time it takes to burn most of the fuel, which is much greater than the recurrence time, which is like hours to days. So the duty cycle is very, very small. So it's extremely improbable that at each point on the neutron star, you're going to, that, you know, within a second have uh, therm uh, uh, thermal instability. What's much more likely is you're going to have thermal instability at some point, okay, and that stuff is that it's going to burn, uh, that matter is going to burn locally, and you're going to have a flame spread across the entire neutron star surface, okay? So if you want to have long-lived oscillations, long-lived meaning longer oscillations last much longer than the rotation period of a neutron star, we need to confine this flame front. We want this hot spot to grow slowly so it can last for many rotation periods of the neutron star and just generate the oscillations, okay? The, um, the width of the oscillations or? Oh, here? Do they get wider? So there's, the, um, yeah, the amplitude module, it's the, the frequency might. Right. I'm sorry? The amplitude, right, will go down as a function of time. That, that is the case. The frequency will, can move maybe by a few hertz, but in general is the, is the rotation rate of the, the neutron star, or what we think is the rotation rate. Um, Yes, they are. Yeah, is that because they're phase wrapped? Yeah, basically. Or is that because it's, it's that space that you can set space that you can set space that you can Yeah. They're really, they're really just wrapped. Not the same. What, 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 is, what is the waveform actually? How does, it, how does it set space? Or is that something that you just don't have the signal to know here to set? Oh, uh, I'm not really sure what it looks like. Um, I Well, more so in the decay than the, than the rise, but there is a high degree. So it's also complicated, though the, the amplitude may be large. 
the <coughs> intensity is relatively small during the rise, right? Here, you're not getting that many photons to begin with. So the amplitude may be large in principle, but it might be harder to, to extract that. You see them sometimes in the rise. Um, and I'll explain why you sometimes see them and sometimes don't see them in the rise, right? OK. So um, uh, right. So we want to make this, this hot spot last for a long time okay, to, to get the, the oscillations if we want to see them. Okay? To, know, to know that, we have to know the, the flame speed of the, uh, um, around the neutron star. And uh, by the work of uh, Anatoly Spikovsky, um, he studied this. And to make a very simple summary, he found that the flame speed is a function of the latitude. Okay? So uh, the latitude, I'll, I'll say, is lambda, zero at the equator. Okay, so what this formula is basically saying, and all you have to know is that the flame propagates very quickly at the equator. And it turns out it's because the Coriolis force is very small at the equator and cannot confine the, the flame. But the flame speed is much slower once you get near the poles, where the Coriolis force is greater and can actually uh, uh, confine the spot. Okay? So um, with that in mind, if we want to find a scenario where you can have this hot spot last a long time, we need to know what the ignition latitude is. What is the latitude of the ignition point? And from there, we can kind of estimate um, how long the, the hot spot is going to uh, survive. Okay? So in order to do that, I'm just going to make one uh, basic but very you know, secure, I would say, assumption that the fuel spreads in such a way as to minimize the gravitational potential energy. That seems reasonable. Gravity is, so, is you know, really strong on the, on the neutron star, and the ignition is deep enough where you know, any asymmetries you'd have from the actual accretion are just going to be totally washed out by that depth. All right. So by this assumption, we find that the, the pressure at the base of the accreted layer is a constant in space. Okay? It'll increase as a function of time, but at any given time, it's a constant throughout the, the 4 pi of the neutron star. Yeah. Well, there'd be an asymmetry in, which I'm going to get to in a second, in the amount of matter piled up at, at a given latitude. But it's the pressure at the base, which is going to be the same thing, right? So this is uh, the fact that the pressure is, uh, is independent of, of latitude um, comes directly from, you know, if we have this rapidly spinning neutron star and I want to just minimize the gravitational energy. Um, you know, this, this follows directly from it. It's basically, you know, um, uh, lines of constant phi correspond to lines of uh, equipotential uh, pressure surfaces, right? So the gradient of, of the gravitational potential is in the same direction as the gradient of the pressure. And so going from here, this follows out naturally. But the, the matter, the amount of matter at a given latitude is going to be different because of this, right? So if the pressure is the same uh, overall, space, all of the 4 pi of the neutron star. But the effect of gravitational acceleration is a function of latitude. In particular, it's much smaller at the equator because it's rotating so rapidly and the centrifugal force is so high. And it's going to be much greater at the, uh, at the poles because the centrifugal force doesn't make much of a difference. Okay? Um, and so matter is going to be piling at the equator faster, at a faster rate than it will at the, at the poles, right? just to make this equal in space. Okay? And so we could think of the, the local accretion rate is going to be higher at the equator. So you're piling on much more matter at the, at the equator than you are at the pole. Okay? And so it's, right. So, um, it turns out that it, when you take this into account, um, the local accretion rate is more than anything else, the most important uh, thing that's going to set the ignition. It's going to help set the, the, the temperature. Um, at the, the shallow depths at which ignition occurs, 
the uh, uh, at least for these ty kinds of bursts, the, uh, the like thermal state of the interior really makes no difference for these kind of bursts. There are other bursts where it does, but the temperature and everything is really set by the local accretion rate uh, on the neutron star. Um, and yes, you bring up a point which brings up a, well, a complication which I'll, uh, um, I'll get to later. But um, this is at least this is uh, still relevant. Okay. Um, and it'll help uh, illustrate why we see the oscillations arising even at a greater um, range of accretion rates. But let me get, the, get there. Okay, so, uh, right, the local accretion rate is highest at the equator. And so, in principle, you'll, you'll build up a, um, a critical pile that will ignite at the equator first, okay? And so we expect ignition at the equator, okay? And that's what uh, Spikovsky et al. Concluded. But what happens if you have ignition at the equator? Okay, well, the flame sp spreads really fast um, at the equator, but it much, gets much slower as you move uh, north south. So you, if you have ignition, say, near the equator, you'll, it'll spread very rapidly uh, around the equator, but much more slowly up and down. And so what you'll get is a very, a very axisymmetric belt that'll grow towards the, the poles slowly. And since we have no non-axis symmetry, right, if you rotate this thing, it's going to look basically the same. And so you're not going to get any oscillations, okay? Well, it's a problem. We know we see oscillations in a lot of uh, rises of type 1 x-ray bursts, okay? But there's an ingredient that, that we haven't put in yet, and that's uh, the fact that both theory and observations imply that there's a critical accretion rate above which bursts don't occur, okay? So all theories though they made um, different the details. All theories predict this, and observations support this as well, okay? So what this means, there's a range of high global accretion rates uh, in which the nuclear burning is going to be stable at the equator because the local accretion rate is very high at the equator, but it's going to be unstable closer to the poles where the local accretion rate is lower, okay? So if the global accretion rate is relatively high, then you can have a, uh, um, a scenario where uh, you have stable burning here, unstable burning, you know, say in the mid latitudes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thermally unstable, right? Okay. So that will imply at the highest global accretion rates, you're going to get non-equatorial ignition. Okay. So what happens in that case? High accretion rate, we have non-equatorial ignition. The flame speed is much slower at, the, at or near the poles than it is at the equator. And so um, this hot spot is going to grow much more slowly. In particular, it's going to grow slow relative to the rotation period of the neutron star. So you're going to have this non axisymmetry symmetry last for many rotation periods, and this will generate the oscillations during the burst rise. Okay, so just a quick summary. The oscillations of the burst rise are due to some hot spot on the neutron star centered at the ignition, and we see them at high accretion rates only uh, because we have non-equatorial ignition um, at high accretion rates. Now, as um, was mentioned a little earlier, this picture gets a little more complicated, and that range of accretion rates is not so high that you'd get just thinking about the difference in the gravitational acceleration between the equator and the pole. But there's a, um, observationally, we see that the burst rate decreases at high accretion rates uh, as, um, as a function of accretion rate. And this will mean, if you, again, translate this locally, um, okay, so what would you expect? You expect that the uh, burst rate will grow linearly with the accretion rate, right? The faster you pile on matter, the sooner you're going to get uh, a critical pile to generate instability. But in fact, if you look at the average burst rate, which are these pluses, they go up, and then at about you know five or ten percent Eddington, they start to go down. All right, and this translates, you know, so in this range, you will again have non-equatorial ignition for us a very similar reason, right? So this means that locally, you'll need to to pile on an even higher, um, uh, larger column uh, of matter to to get an, an instability. 
the, um, in general, I guess that's true, if you look at the uh, average uh, energy release via gravity, um, and then over the average energy release during a burst, that fraction drops. It's, what this is telling you is there's some stable. Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, that's true as well. Yes, yes. Right, so the bursts at higher accretion rates in general will release less energy, which kind of makes sense. Okay. So this is a, another uh, characteristic of type 1 X-ray burst, which is will extend the range over which um, oscillations during the rise will occur. And this actually matches very well with what we see. Oscillations in the rise will occur, you know, in the same range of accretion rates where we had this uh, uh, decrease in the, in the burst rate. Okay. So why we actually have this decrease in the burst rate is a totally different story. Um, right, so we have the oscillations in this range, which I will not go into. Okay, so that's the oscillations in the burst rise. Hot spot due to non-equatorial ignition. Now let's talk about oscillations during the, the decay. Okay, this rotationally modulated hot spot model isn't going to work for oscillations in, in the burst decay because the flame has totally engulfed the neutron star by the time we've hit the, the, uh, the peak in the, in the light curve. Okay? So what we think it is, is uh, the best model so far is that these flux modulations are due to a surface mode or some sort of non-radial oscillation, just like a, a shallow ocean wave or something like that, surface wave. Okay, well, uh, the surface wave will create temperature inhomogeneities on, on the neutron star surface. And as those temperature inhomogeneities are uh, rotationally modulated, it will generate the, the oscillations. And for various reasons, uh, the surface mode idea um, supports, the observations really support this surface mode idea very well. Okay. So we have some um, pattern due to the, the modes. Okay, and these patterns have uh, an oscillation frequency of, a, of, say, a few hertz. Okay, you know, you have matter slashing around non-radially, which creates a temperature in homogeneity, right? Um, and that's in the co-rotating frame of the neutron star, which itself is spinning very fast, several hundred hertz. And so the observed frequency is basically the um, rotation frequency for an m equals 1 mode, plus or minus the mode frequency. So it's the sum of the two, right? Um, but the mode is generally not over the entire neutron star, but over some fraction of it. And, but the oscillation amplitude is pretty large, like 10%. So the actual fluctuations in the, uh, the non-radial oscillations, they have to be huge, like of order unity to support these 10% uh, flux variations. Right? And you can't have that by just some transient phenomenon. These modes have to be driven if you're going to get such large um, amplitudes, okay? So they must be driven unstable. Right? So what is it that drives the modes? Well, you know, you need some, usually need some energy source to drive the modes, and what better energy source than a type 1 x-ray burst than nuclear burning, right? Um, however, you know, nuclear burning is thermally stable once you hit the decay. It's thermally unstable during the rise, but you already hit your peak temperatures, had a good amount of burning, and this is just some residual burning in the decay. So um, can't be a pure thermal instability that's driving these modes. But can you have uh, nuclear burning be uh, stable to thermal perturbations, but unstable to, say, pressure perturbations or some non-radial perturbation? And the answer is definitely yes, OK? Um, so it turns out the, the mode driver is what's called the epsilon mechanism. Okay? So uh, a general um, quality of, of oscillation, say in stars, right, Cepheids or something, is that you can tell uh, a region will be uh, stable or unstable to uh, mode by figuring out does the entropy or heat content increase or decrease when you squish it. Okay? So if it gains heat or gains entropy when, it, when you compress it, it's a driving region. Okay? But if it loses entropy, then it's, uh, it's a damping region. This is sort of like uh, in your car, right? So um, piston compresses, and, and the car engine itself in such a way that when it compresses, you know, your spark burns a little uh, gasoline and you know, creates entropy and pushes back. Okay? And so you get a, 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 you know, a driving there. Here, 
you know, we have to say, okay, if we have this um, column of matter and then we compress it, if the heating rate, because of that compression, um, uh, rises enough, then some of that nuclear energy generated will convert to mechanical energy and push back even harder, okay? So we squish it. If the, uh, if the nuclear energy generation rate, you know, increases enough, and it'll push back even, even harder, and the modes will be driven unstable. But if the cooling over, um, if the cooling overtakes that, if the cooling gets rid of more entropy than you get by the um, increase in nuclear uh, reaction rate when you compress it, then the modes would be stable, okay? So the nuclear energy converts to mechanical energy and, divide, and um, drives the modes, okay? So for um, a nuclear energy generation rate that, say, just goes as t to the nu, uh, we find that if the heating rate is uh, relative to the cooling rate is greater than some uh, fraction, right? If the heating rate is basically significantly large during the, uh, the tail of the burst, uh, the modes will be driven unstable, okay? And this also depends on the temperature dependence of the reaction rate, okay? And you should also note this is less restrictive than the pure thermal instability criterion, which would naively, you'd think that this ratio would have to be greater than one. But here it can be less than one, but you can still have non-radial modes driven by uh, nuclear reactions, okay? So we can have surface modes be driven unstable during the first decay via the epsilon mechanism even when it's thermally stable. All right, and so this will favor powerful bursts. Powerful bursts because the heating rate is very large. If you have a lot of nuclear burning going on in a short amount of time, the heating rate's gonna be large. And it also uh, favors reactions with, that are very temperature sensitive. Now, if you remember going back to, uh, to the hydrogen burning, the helium burning, hydrogen burning is very temperature insensitive because you had these slow beta decays where something like helium burning, the rate would be very temperature sensitive, okay? And this is exactly what we see. Oscillations are expected in short hydrogen poor bursts. Heating rates large, temperature uh, dependence is large, and not in the long helium rich bursts. And this is exactly the case. All bursts that are not accreting uh, from systems that are not pulsars, which are a different story, which I won't go into, uh, that show oscillations in the decay phase are short hydrogen poor bursts. This is an observational fact, okay? Um, so, and this explains, we also see short bursts only at high accretion rates, and this explains why we see the oscillations in the decay only at high accretion rates, okay? Um, but there are some bursts that are so powerful that uh, some of the nuclear energy converts to kinetic energy of the photosphere and actually lifts the photosphere up. So what happens here is the, the, the nuclear luminosity exceeds the Eddington limit, so the photon uh, luminosity basically remains at the Eddington limit, okay? But we see the, an increase in the black body radius, and, and uh, um, along with that, uh, a decrease in the, in the temperature, black body temperature. This is basically the photosphere of the neutron star expanding out to, you know, many kilometers and then falling back, okay? But we never, ever, ever see oscillations during photospheric radius expansion bursts, which is totally, um, you know, against what I just said. We want really powerful bursts if we're going to have oscillations. But these are about as powerful as you can get. We never see it. And this is because during a photospheric radius expansion burst, the nuclear burning is so powerful that we get a really large convection zone, okay? And uh, so to say it quite simply, uh, so cooling is dominated not by uh, radiative diffusion, but by convection. And this changes the, the, the stability criterion. In particular, convection, when, if you compress a convection zone, it will transport energy much, uh, very effectively when, uh, when it's compressed, much more effectively than a, a radiative zone. And this is why we don't see oscillations during um, photospheric radius expansion bursts is because of this convection zone. Okay, and, and just in passing, this is the same explanation as, as why uh, pulsating stars, like at the red edge of the, the instability strip, this is what kills the oscillations in the red edge of the instability strip. You have this very efficient, large convection zone, and uh, it basically damps out the, uh, the oscillation. So it's, just, it's the same idea. Okay, so um, 
I'm just gonna leave my, I'm probably go on overtime, so I'm just gonna leave my conclusions up. And that who's my talk. <laughs> Okay, well, let, yeah, let me just. Okay, so, um, well, okay, so uh, all the modes are going to be non-radial. I mean, they're almost forced to be non-radial because the rotation is so, is so great. And the R modes in themselves are non-radial modes. Yeah, it, that just happens to, um, uh, the R modes fit the observations the best because the R modes travel in a, the retrograde mo motion. They have a retrograde motion and the, the frequencies work out pretty well. Okay, yeah. Um, the, uh, that, that's still a mystery, right? Um, so our analysis says that you know you could have G modes, you could have Kelvin modes. Uh, it's not clear why it's just R modes. Some of it may be just a uh, um, the R modes, um, that in particular the M equals one R mode is just easiest to see because it has, you know, it would just generate the largest flux amplitudes. It could be that there are other modes that are going on that that just have amplitudes that are so small that you wouldn't see them. It's a possibility, or it could be that they're not excited at all. I don't know which is the uh, which is correct, if if either of those. Um, but yeah, that's that's yet to be determined. The growth rate will depend on uh, basically the this ratio, basically how well you uh, satisfy this ratio. So if this ratio is higher. The growth rate will be faster. So it's going to, it, the growth rate depends on the, the heating versus cooling. But even if it's on the order of the period of mode, you see you're almost going up to 10 seconds. And, and, and so you know that the period is roughly a second or so of the mode, so the more the it is. The growth rate is fine. I mean, you have, you have 10 well, that's growth times. Let's say it's 10% growth rate for the period, right? And here we have a lot of Yeah, I mean, normal. Really? Well, no, I, you know, the, the theory is really so far behind. This is really, very, you know, the first time anyone's ever even attacked this problem. So this was a very simple one zone uh, calculation. Um, it's, it'll depend so much on the actual nuclear burning that's going on and the effects of rotation, which right now are way beyond what people can, can do right now. Um, which is, you know, it's unfortunate, but, you know, we do what we can do. You know, I think at least, if, if anything, the spirit of uh, what we find so far is, is going to carry on. Maybe not the details, but, yeah, I mean, you're totally right. All this stuff is going to be a function of, you know, what's the detail of the nuclear physics and the microphysics, which I, I can't really, no one can really address with any confidence right now. Yes. Entirely. Yes. So you're not having to push around the inertia of the mode. Well, the mode has a hot thermal mass of our data set, but all also inertia mode has very, very little compression. So you're talking about a very small compression in this mode. Yeah, sure. No, I, 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 I agree with you there. I'm not sure why they chose an R mode in particular and not a G mode for Kelly and Matthew. But that's the A plus the Matthew is going to have to be compressed a little. You're not going to be able to do something like No, that's, that's a, and it's a good question. I mean, there's a lot of stuff still to be done. I suppose that brings up the next question, is, is, is why do you naturally choose such a, I know of observation why, but naturally physically, why would you choose a mode with such large angular correlations, even though necessarily it has such small
small radio program because it is essentially a church school. Yeah. And, and that's good. That's good. Well, it's like you can't get anything. Eight modes, even the kids. No, no, no. Obviously, it has to be. Yeah. Yeah, this is Right, that is a possibility. Absolutely. It could be, yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, uh, well, I don't know about so much in the decay. So, uh, okay, uh, if you look at the convection zone, yeah, the thermal, thermal, okay, yeah, so the thermal diffusion time is, you know, several seconds, depends on the temperature and the flux and stuff. The convection zone, you know, a lot of bursts may show a convection zone. It may not grow that much, but it will be around the peak. And in fact, you know, if you look at this, stability criterion, you think, well, why don't you see oscillations during the peak of a burst all the time? Uh, and it could be that, again, because you have a convection zone near this peak, that it's killing that as well. And, you know, by the time you hit here, your convection zone's pretty much dead. Then it's all radiated diffusion, and now you can actually uh, uh, drive your modes, okay, because the cooling can't adjust as well if it's just radiated. This is all possible. I mean, there's, yeah, there's, we've really just scratched the surface of, of, of what's going on um, in these burst oscillations. Um, so. Well, again, so um, if you actually had pure helium, you would probably burn it all in two uh, shorter time scale to generate oscillations. And so there has to be some balance. It has to take long enough such that you don't g drive a huge convection zone and finish all the burning in a tenth of a second. But it can't be too long because the burning has to be large enough um, to actually drive the mode. So there's, you know, there's sort of this Goldilocks thing. It can't be too short. It can't be too long. Um, and, you know, Aside from the duration of the burst, it's really hard to, really it's impossible now to calculate the, uh, the composition of the burst, the composition of the burst, uh, or the composition of the matter prior to ignition because there's a lot of other uncertainties in the, in, just in the burst models themselves and the nuclear physics itself, which um, is vitally important to burst oscillations but it's, you know, it's an issue in and of itself, which is not well understood, but is, is, it turns out to be very important for these guys. Um, so, yeah. There's, 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 there's a lot to do, definitely. Um, Why does the frequency of the mode change? Like time per decade? So the, mo the frequency of the mode changes because the, um, it's, it's, it, it itself is a function of temperature. And as the burst decays the the temperature goes down okay and the the okay so the um the mode is retrograde and the frequency of the mode decreases with with temperature okay, so here the temperature is high the uh, mode period is the mode frequency is high but it's retrograde so the frequency is low and as it cools the mode frequency decreases that's why you get uh, progressively increasing um, and so temperature. The, 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 the first oscillations during the ride, they're also retrograde. Is that still the idea that the weather system type thing that, that the dust gets all that? 
Yeah, and that's the still the basic idea. Yeah. So, you know, there's also other details. You know, sometimes you see uh, oscillations last in the rise, in the peak, and the decay, and they seem to be all connected. But I just told you the story where they're two different things. So there may be some connection between the hot spot, growing hot spot, and the and the modes. So. Yeah, right? So maybe this was, you know, a hot spot that just didn't last very long and then Yeah. You get the same thing both the equal to your period and because the second your cooling your cooling time was a few seconds. The period is about a second, which means that you dump half your thermal energy into cooling and you your burning rate is comparable to that. That means every time you compress the matter by ten percent, you increase your thermal energy quantum by ten times new. So The heating time scale may be different than the cooling time scale. So the, the, the right. we're not. I think it's a really good point. That, that's also been said. It's also been said roughly that the uh, shortest period oscillation you're going, you're going to expect, right? Because you're not going to. Um, so the next mode is a comparable term. That's that's right. Comparable term. Thank <laughs> you.